Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for what promises to be a fantastic discussion about the future of federal housing policy, um, highlighted by our special guest today, um, former Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Leon Castro. My name is Mike Lenz, and I am Associate Professor of Urban Planning and Public Policy at the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. Uh, this discussion is part of our ongoing Housing Equity and Community Series, which is a joint effort between the UCLA Zyman Center for Real Estate and UCLA Lewis Center for Regional Policy Studies. Um, at the Lewis Center, I serve as well as the Associate Faculty Director and uh, Director of Housing Initiative. Thank you to the Zyman and Lewis Centers, and I want to especially thank my colleagues at both of those centers um, for making all this possible. And before I introduce Secretary Castro, I wish to welcome you all with a, a, this land acknowledgement. As a land-grant institution, UCLA acknowledges uh, the, and honors the sacrifice of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tobangar, the land upon which the UCLA campus now stands. Now to Secretary Castro, our special guest today. Not that any of us are really thinking about presidential politics today, but of course, many of us know Julian Castro is a candidate for president in the most recent cycle for the Democratic Party. In that role, in my view, uh, Castro earned a reputation for staunchly pro uh, defending progressive values in ways that I would say seem uh, particularly present in 2020. Uh, a specific uh, local example is uh, late last year, Secretary Castro met with Black Lives Matter Los Angeles um, well before other mainstream politicians outwardly supported the movement in, in the aftermath of the murders of George Floyd and so many others. On the housing front, as I mentioned, Castro served as the U.S. Secretary for Housing and Urban Development under President Obama from 2014 to 2017. Prior to that, Secretary Castro was mayor of San Antonio, which I think is an underrated city, um, and you can visit when it's time to do that. Um, and this work, of course, has provided him with unique insight into the federal government's role in promoting fair housing and housing affordability and equity. And as a mayor, um, obviously, uh, Secretary Castro can understand um, the local constraints and, and, and opportunities around housing. Uh, we won't be able to hear you out there in Zoom land, but uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Secretary Julian Castro. Yay! Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> so, a little bit of the run of show. Um, Secretary Castro will offer remarks for the next few minutes, then I will ask him some questions, um, and then we will take questions from the audience, uh, roughly around 1230, and um, uh, Secretary Castro has a hard stop at about 1245, um, after which uh, I will be joined by Cecilia Estelano and Jose Loya to keep the discussion going. Okay, Secretary Castro. We originally envisioned this event as, as being about the stakes for, for federal housing policy and in in, with the election outcome uncertain. We are still kind of in that uh, stage, of course, where the election outcome is uncertain. Um, but perhaps the most likely scenario is a divided federal government, right? Uh, um, a Biden presidency, a Democratic House, a, a GOP Senate, and a conservative-leaning uh, Supreme Court. This is very similar to what you faced as um, Secretary of HUD. Uh, so, you know, what do the next four years of federal leadership on housing look like to you under these conditions? Yeah, well, Dr. Lenz, thank you so much uh, for having me here today and to everybody else who helped put this together, both of the centers and to the uh, folks out at UCLA. It's great to be with y'all. Uh, hello from San Antonio, Texas where like y'all, I'm uh, anxiously watching all of the results trickle in and the counting getting done in all of these states. And you're right, of course, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen in the presidential race. It looks like Joe Biden will likely be elected president, that he'll get to 270 votes. Uh, and the, the Senate is up in the air now, but it's very possible that Republicans maintain control of it, which would create divided government as we've dealt with several times in the last couple of decades. Um, and so what it means is that um, we're going to have to be as creative and as um, also, I think, uh, assertive um, and 
um, also uh, open to working across the aisle where we can when it comes to housing policy and just about every other type of policy. Uh, I believe that we should see housing as a human right in this country, that we should strive to make sure that every single person has a safe, decent, affordable place to live. The challenge is that for the better part of 40 years or so, we really haven't had the commitment that we used to have in this country to creating housing opportunity that's affordable for low-income individuals and even for middle-class families. Uh, coming into this election, we coming into COVID-19, we already had a rental affordability crisis in the United States. We had homelessness that was beginning to grow in many areas again. Um, and uh, home ownership levels that were still lower than they had been pre-Great Recession. At one point, about five years ago, they were the lowest they had been in about 40 years. Uh, so you throw all that together and there is a dire need to focus on housing like never before. And yet, tenure after tenure, Congress after Congress, administration after administration, with some notable examples, I would say um, the Recovery Act, getting out of the Great Recession, with some notable examples, um, you know, we haven't had that commitment. It doesn't become the priority. So, the number one thing we need to do in this transition is to push to try and make it as great a priority as possible uh, and find those allies who have been there on the other side of the aisle who might be willing to help make it a greater priority. I'll, I'll just briefly um, give you a good example of that. When I was at HUD, uh, one of the folks that was receptive to investing significantly more in addressing youth homelessness was Senator Collins out of Maine. Uh, Senator Collins retained her Senate seat, although many folks didn't think that she would. Um, is there an opportunity, whether it's on youth homelessness or something else, to work with a senator like that who may be interested in investing more? My concern is that even when we find those allies, the scale of what we actually need to do uh, I don't know that people are ready for. And so the, the game plan that needs to be put together is how do you get there frustratingly incrementally, but at least begin moving in the right direction to get there? Lots of interesting stuff um, there uh, from you know, your recent experience, of course, and, you know, kind of how we read things going forward. You know, I... I you know, an interesting thing in housing to, to me is that, you know, it really flies under the radar. Uh, I think it's particularly in the national conversation, right? You know, if you think about housing as, you know, the, the, the good that we all spend the most money on, you know, it's the, and it's the most visible thing in our lives, right? Um, housing, housing is everywhere and, and, housing problems are, are incredibly acute for people who struggle with them. Yet the federal conversation or the national conversation on housing is really quite muted. It's, it's rarely like a hot debate topic. There's not, you know, very obviously drawn ideological camps about housing, you know, although like, you know, one party is likely to be more pro market than the other, but like, um, in some ways, you know, if you compare to topics that are more heated, like health care or education, um, you know, it flies under the radar. And that, in, in my view, could be an opportunity in a very, uh, in, in our current environment, which is undoubtedly very partisan. Um, you know, but then, like, there are still things that distinguish the two parties. Like, you know, how would you kind of frame a a democratic vision on housing versus a Republican vision on housing? Or, you know, what do you think, you know, what do you think a democratic administration like you served in, which Biden will obviously be, you know, kind of closely tied to, how, how are they going to try to push the envelope or what are the priorities you see them, them targeting? That's a great question. Uh, and there certainly is, traditionally a difference in approach between Republicans and Democrats. Going into the next term, on the Democratic side, beginning with the hopefully president-elect, 
you know, Joe Biden put out a $640 billion plan uh, that would invest fairly robustly in housing opportunity that includes uh, some good ideas like uh, universalizing the housing choice voucher program um, and investing billions of dollars to create more units of affordable housing, in addition to um, remedying some of the steps backward that we've taken over the last four years with the Fair Housing Act, pursuing again, things like AFFH and the equal access rule to ensure that if you're a member of the LGBTQ community, you, know, you can go into the housing market to rent an apartment or find a house and not be subject to lawful discrimination or what should be unlawful discrimination. Uh, so, you know, he has put forward this robust plan. And now the challenge is uh, if we end up with a Senate that is, you know, 51 Republican or 52, um, yeah, 52 Republican, 48 Democrat, are we able to accomplish that? I think that's where you need to push as hard as possible and then also build bridges. I'll give you an example of where Washington worked the way that we would hope it would. Uh, the Obama administration's push after opening doors, which was its blueprint in 2010 to end homelessness in the United States, beginning with veteran homelessness, the administration made a push to invest in ending veteran homelessness. And, uh, you know, it used the uh, U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness or Usage to coordinate 19 federal departments' efforts on it. The first lady and the president uh, launched the mayor's challenge to end veteran homelessness that more than 800 local and state officials signed up on uh, and implemented best practice policies, whether it was housing first or by name lists or uh, coordinated entry. And then in D.C., the House and the Senate allocated the dollars for, cho for uh, vouchers to veterans who needed them and administrative money to the VA to be able to administer that program uh, effectively, along with HUD. So Washington worked the way that it's supposed to work. Now, what do we take from that? Well, number one, you have, uh, I would argue, in veterans, right, a, a crossover issue there in terms of a group that often gets support from Democrats and Republicans. So there's probably more uh, willingness on the part of Republicans to make that investment. Uh, secondly, and this goes to, to part of your question about the distinction between Democratic and Republican approaches, investing in the housing choice voucher program is investing in a market-based program because you're getting money into the private housing market. Uh, I would put the same, uh, or I, I view the same um, way, something like RAD, the Rental Assistance Demonstration that emerged after 2012 because we haven't been investing in public housing in a traditional democratic way, you know, this attempt to get the private sector involved that got Republican support. So um, without compromising effectiveness uh, for the people that we're trying to serve, look, are there ways that you can integrate that market-based approach I'll tell you, in most instances, that's not my first instinct. I, I'm somebody that believes that we need to invest much more robustly in public housing, that if we have more good, uh, well-preserved, well-maintained public housing right now, we wouldn't be in the affordability crisis that we're in. However, um, you know, we also have to work within the confines of what we're dealing with. And so you have to get creative those two instances of uh, veteran homelessness and, and uh, rental assistance demonstration may provide some lessons that we can learn from. Yeah, yeah, that's very, those are very important examples, I, I agree. Um, and they do kind of thread a needle, I think, politically, um, as well as, like you said, maintaining effectiveness. You know, I, I wanted to get in, into the weeds a little bit about um, the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, uh, AFFH, um, you know, and, and in a couple for a couple of reasons. You know, we, you know, if we if we're right kind of about what the composition is going to look like in the various branches of government going forward, um, you know, you have 
you know, in AFFH, uh, an executive rule of, essentially that you know you know shifts accountability measures of, for local governments around fair housing and segregation by income and race. Um, that really is kind of a loss for a under and not executed really promise going back to the Fair Housing Act of, of 1968. And then, you know, we also have, you know, and this is, of course, something that the Trump admis- administration rescinded. And the, the president has been very vocal um, throughout the campaign on uh, really attacking the premise of fair housing and the premise that, um, you know, suburban areas uh, in particular should be welcome to uh, additional multifamily housing or, or housing that is more affordable to uh, people of color and low income people specifically. So, you know, what, you know, you were head of HUD when, you know, the Obama administration rolled that rule out. You know, what did you learn from the process of, of reforming fair housing law in that kind of dramatic way? And, you know, how do you think fair housing should be addressed by, you know, the, the Biden administration or future administrations as they come? Well, for the Biden administration, I, I believe that uh, fair housing should be uh, robustly addressed, defended, expanded, invested in, in every way possible uh, under the, you know, within legal means. Uh, yeah, I mean, Donald Trump tried to demagogue this issue of housing opportunity, particularly with regard to opportunity in America's suburbs for low-income people and people of color, especially. You know, in my mind, basically, he was trying to scare up what he sees as white Americans who might be concerned about people of color, especially Blacks, Black Americans, moving into their neighborhood. And it was, to me, it was disgusting. Um, you know, this was a naked attempt to play at racism. Uh, and also, I think it was a lie in three different ways. Number one, he was lying about the policy. Washington did not dictate to these local communities how they had to go about forging a plan for greater housing opportunity. In fact, you asked about lessons learned. One of the things that was learned from the first time HUD went through that exercise, which was in the late 90s, but didn't get it over the finish line, and when it came back in the mid 2010s was that it needed to go and get the advice and the input of local communities. And so there was a whole process of meeting with mayors and local staffs and housing authorities and counties about, okay, look, how can we shape something here that you can live with? Mm -hmm. You know, basically this, this AFFA was asking these jurisdictions to submit a plan on how they were gonna ensure there was greater fair housing opportunity but it needed to be workable at the local level. I certainly appreciate that as a former local official, right? Um, So it didn't dictate anything. The second lie about it was a lie about the suburbs. They are more diverse now than they used to be. I mean, we shouldn't kid ourselves. Racism is still still very much alive and well, and it still is impacting housing patterns. But people of different backgrounds live together much more than they did when we passed the Fair Housing Act in 1968. And we saw, you know, a demonstration of this here in Texas and how Texas is changing politically, even though it did not turn over this year, it got a lot more competitive because you have diverse suburbs. Um, And then the third, I think, is a lie about the vast majority of white Americans. Um, We know that there is still tremendous racism in our country, but I also don't believe the vast majority of white Americans are sitting there just trying to figure out how they can keep people of color out every single day from their neighborhood. Um, but that was the president's view of what would appeal to them, what would move their vote in his direction. Um, we need to wash our hands of that in the next administration as quickly as possible. And I hope that one of the first things that the Biden administration does is take the list of rules that have been promulgated uh, or put on ice like that one by this administration and direct the acting secretary on January, on the afternoon of January 20th, 2021, to immediately begin reversing these. Um, and, And then we can go forward 
not only to what we did in the Obama administration, but perhaps even improve upon that, go even further, um, because we live in a diverse 21st century. And there's no reason, particularly when we've seen research like Raj Chetty's and so forth about the impact yeah. that, that, you know, these living in these neighborhood, neighborhoods can have, people should have a fair shot. I mean, we don't guarantee people anything, but people should have a fair shot. They shouldn't be kept out just because of who they are. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly how I see it generally. And, you know, you, you've hinted at, a, at something that I, I wanted to follow up on anyway, which is, you know, AFH is not the only rule, right, that, that, you, that um, you could uh, issue. And, you know, executive orders, for better or worse, are, are going to have to be relied upon by an administration that has so much uh, resistance from the Congress. Are there are there a couple other things that you're that you would uh, be looking at uh, if you were you know running the transition team for for Biden or if you, on, on housing or if you were the next secretary? There's some other things that um, could be d- done through the rulemaking process. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there are steps backward that we've taken that we need to remedy. That I mentioned, for instance, the equal access rule specifically with the extension of it to transgender individuals. Uh, you know, the, this administration has sought to peel that back. Um, this rule basically ensured that if somebody who is a transgender shows up at a federally funded shelter, that they would be accommodated according to how they're comfortable. Uh, and again, the administration has caricatured it, has created, uh, like you see at a lot of local levels, uh, when we talk about non-discrimination ordinances, for instance, bathroom bills at the state level, they've demagogued it to suggest that this is going to create a danger for people, which there's no evidence of. Um, I would, I would seek to turn back what they've done and then move us to real equality again. Um, small area fair market rent, for instance. One of the things that we were clearly doing is that we were getting more granular in our policies, whether it was it was um, uh, small DBAs in low-income housing tax credits or small area fair market rents in our, our housing choice vouchers. Uh, we need to continue to do that to to get more granular in terms of giving people the resources that they need to actually make the most use of the federal tool, uh, the the investment that has been given um, has been provided for housing opportunity. Uh, Because there was some pushback from California communities and New York communities, I suppose, and, and, or for other ideological reasons, uh, this administration stepped back. I believe on small area fair market rents, we need to go forward with that. Um, and there are a number of other things. I mean, there were at the end of the Obama administration, there were, you know, probably a couple of dozen potential rules that were still on the table. And I would revisit those and see what's applicable now and where we how we could go forward. Right. Yeah. And the you know the research on small area fair market rents in particular is is still you know, coming out, but it, there are a lot of kind of promising findings on how you, just those little tweaks and that, you know, more granular geography can can really influence the potential for people to reach different neighborhoods in different places. Um, but, you know, before we head to the audience question, I, you know, you brought up the issue of veterans uh, homelessness. And, and, you know, when I think back to, you um, you know, a few years ago, I, I fully agree that particularly in Los Angeles, there was a lot of movement on veterans homelessness uh, with the help of um, expanded uh, housing voucher funds. Um, but, you know, it, it, you probably haven't had the opportunity to come to come through Los Angeles for a minute. But, yeah, um, yeah. you know, the, the situation here is is extremely dire and you know i keep using the phrase it's a humanitarian crisis really where we where we are with homelessness in our region um this is an incredibly wealthy country it's an incredibly wealthy state it's a wealthy city it's a it's a state and city controlled by democrats um and you know we here in los angeles we have um you know we've we've 
voted to tax ourselves to increase uh, spending on supportive housing for the homeless. Um, but the problem just does not is 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 really uh, on a scale that again I think is is beyond crisis moment. You know, what do you see as uh, the federal role going forward in homelessness? I mean, you know, to, it, it's not the, a nationwide crisis in the way that it is in Los Angeles. And so I think, you know, there are different local solutions probably that, that we're looking for, looking for, but we need federal money. No doubt. I mean, there needs to be substantial investment uh, and partnerships with state and local communities to invest dollars in the ways that are going to be most effective and appropriate in those local communities. Um, I mean, you're absolutely correct, of course, that Los Angeles, different from Phoenix or or even more so from a small town somewhere in the Midwest. Um, at the same time, I do think we've reached this point, particularly right now when it comes to housing, where you have people all over the country that are facing the potential for eviction. Mm. Uh, frankly, this hasn't devolved into the kind of situation, the worst case scenario that many folks thought that it could. However, uh, the, the further we go along with a dampened economy and, and more landlords turn around soon and say, oh, well, where's my four or five or six or eight months worth of back rent? And people don't have that. We are, I think, whether it's in one big tidal wave or we're going to see it just with, you know, more higher numbers in general of evictions, we are going to see greater numbers of evictions in the next, if you just take it out the next nine months or a year. And that's everywhere. So I always preached when I was in, in D.C., OK, well, look, we need to engage in a long term education process with these conservative members who might be at least receptive, some of them to the argument that this is going on in your district, that it's not affecting people based on whether they're Democrat or Republican. And, and these days, it's reaching more and more into the middle class, too. And, and so I think we need to spend as much time as we can trying to build those bridges. But generally, there needs to be more significant investment. Of course, there needs to be changes uh, in land use and um, zoning, planning, codes at the local level. I think uh, part of the role of the federal government is to incentivize communities to do that. I believe that we should use CDBG and Tiger Grants and, uh, and other federal programs uh, as integrate those, integrate um, uh, incentives into those for local communities to tear down some of the barriers that they've created for affordable housing construction. And I know, especially over there in California, there's a huge battle going on between YIMBYs and NIMBYs and people who are skeptical or cynical about new housing investment because of gentrification and displacement. And, you know, I get all that. Obviously, I don't want to see displacement. Uh, and we're seeing it a lot in a lot of places. So the question is, though, like, we do need to create more units, more housing opportunity that, that is affordable. And how do we do that? and still uh, you know, respect and be cognizant of the concerns of people who want to be able to stay in their neighborhood and you know, are concerned about the character of it. Yeah, and so you, you definitely um, you know, pulled us right into the, the fire of, of the big California conversation or one of them, um, and certainly one that is hot in Los Angeles. And it just so happens that our first uh, audience question is is pretty pretty closely tied to what you're just talking about. So it's a bit of a follow up um, from Ryan Silver. Uh, thank you, Ryan. So with so much land use control residing at the local level, do you see a role for the federal government addressing single family zoning and densification? Yeah, I, I think that we should integrate into these funding programs ways to incentivize cities to be a lot better about allowing for the construction of housing that is affordable to the middle class and to low income families. Uh, and you know, I'm not sure that the federal government can dictate that. Uh, you know, uh, for instance, my understanding is that the federal government cannot dictate zoning, right? At the local level. So there's a limit 
to what we can do, but we can use federal funds in a way that incentivizes communities to break down some of that nimbyism that too oftentimes stifles the ability of people of every background to get affordable housing. And it puts in a place like LA, it just puts more and more and more pressure uh, onto the big city, really, um, and a couple of suburbs maybe. But one of the things that we were looking at at HUD and uh, we launched an initiative uh, called the Prosperity Playbook in five different regions, uh, including the Bay Area there in California, that asked suburbs to, to plan with cities for how all of these issues could be connected, like transit, uh, economic development, housing opportunity. And, but part of this also was getting suburbs to be a part of the conversation. Right. Because most suburbs, you know, you talk, well, where's your affordable housing policy or plan? Like, I mean, it's they don't view themselves in that role, right? And so they're not, frankly, they're not doing their part. The vast majority of suburbs are not doing their part, right, to create that affordable housing opportunity. And they need to be doing more. That's a, that's a conversation that is downright explosive at the local yeah. level. Okay, um, one of the most difficult conversations. You will get shouted down, protested. Uh, by the way, by Democrats and Republicans. Absolutely, <laughs> I've seen people that might be the most liberal voters out there, uh, partisan Democrats, in zoning meetings, uh, acting like they were the staunchest Republicans when they thought that poor people might live near them. You know, so we got to be honest about this stuff. You know, and. Um, and really engage in a long-term effort to try and change the carrying of this burden at the local level, the regional level, and also reflect that at the federal level. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's thorny, but I I agree. Like, you know, some of these conversations just happen um, implicitly, right? We don't we don't really you know, bring it to people to talk about like what the real costs and benefits are. And we're maybe not as honest about these conversations as we should be. Um, next question I have from uh, Hannah Kamarik. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, but this is, I like this question because it's, it's getting us out of the confines of, of, you know, political constraints really. And uh, she's following up on when you said that people may not be ready for the scale of change that is needed to address to fully address our housing challenges. And she asked, you know, what would those changes look like if they were possible? If we, you know, what are some of the biggest changes that we need to see um, for housing affordability and justice? Well, I mean, I think that uh, we some of them have been put forward. Uh, Vice President Biden's plan of universalizing housing choice vouchers, for instance, also very massive, significant investment in, in more building more units, as well as more robust enforcement of the Fair Housing Act, and also tackling the tax code. Right now, the tax code, you know, uh, rewards homeowners, which is fine. But I think that, you know, we should think about how you reformulate the mortgage interest deduction, for instance, to use some of that, those resources to invest instead in something like a, a refundable and advanceable renter's tax credit that would benefit renters. If we could do that on a big scale, I think that would go a long way as well to creating more opportunity because you know we, we need to increase the supply. We also need to increase the opportunity of it getting into people's hands and the voucher program and the tax code are two ways that you could do that. Yeah, I mean, if I, I would love it if more people knew the gap between what we spend on the mortgage interest deduction and like every single subsidy that benefits low income uh, housing uh, recipients, right? Um, it's pretty big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, I mean, and as you know, the federal apparatus on home ownership, which look, when I got to HUD, we were getting out of just getting out of all of the response to the Great Recession. And I said that we should end the stigma of home ownership, of, of promoting home ownership. So I certainly believe in that as an opportunity. But I also recognize that 
you know, it's totally unbalanced right now. And that, that for some folks that mortgage interest deduction is very generous. Uh, so, you know, can you shape that in a way that is more impactful to people who need housing opportunity? I think you can and that we should. Um, but I was going to say, I mean, we have the FHA also, right? Uh, we have uh, FHFA that's doing what it can, and it's kind of in a, still in an odd state right now. But um, we've built up a lot around home ownership. And we see one of the most fascinating things that we see is this youngest generation, people that are in their, you know, of, of adults, their early 20s, mid 20s late twenties, they're waiting longer to become homeowners. Yeah. And some of them are choosing not to buy homes. So what does that mean for, okay, well, well, what are we doing for renters? You know, and we need to, we need to be more focused on that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, speaking from Los Angeles, of course, if you're, if you're in your twenties and you can afford a down payment on a house, like you almost certainly come from a parent or two who has money. Right. That's there's no there's no other explanation. Um, almost ninety nine percent of the time, right? Um, you know, we haven't talked a lot about tenant protections. Um, aside from you know when you I, you know very appropriately brought up the you know potential coming eviction waves um, that we have some fear about. Uh, and so this question from Christine or Christian uh, Lua uh, is something that I think is really good to talk about, which is you know. He states that the federal government enforces protections against discrimination, but not so much, does not really have as much of a role on tenant protections or displacement protections. Is there a place for federal policy there? You know, we, we have lots of conversations about rent control and eviction protections here in California, but is there a, a federal role for something like that? That's a great question. I mean, I think there at least is in the form of incentivizing states and local communities to do this. California had this conversation, I think, as part of a, a either legislation or maybe a ballot initiative on whether to be able to expand rent control or uh, give smaller cities, every city, the ability to uh, their choice to implement rent control. You know, I believe that cities should have that power. Uh, I don't. I don't think rent control is appropriate for every single community out there necessarily. But I do think that cities should be empowered with that. Um, and, but the federal government's role could be to incentivize it where it makes sense. Also, um, doing things like investing in legal counsel for people who find themselves in eviction court, right? Because oftentimes folks have no idea. And look, a lot of these cases are cut and dried under state law, unfortunately. So state legislatures, uh, state legislators who are sympathetic to tenants, um, you know, need to be activated, especially during this COVID-19 time, time period to as they as many state legislatures begin their term in January. Right. Do as much as they can to look at those laws and change those laws to make them more protective of tenants. Um, the federal government can incentivize that. We can also make investments so that tenants have legal counsel or other things at their uh, availability so they don't find themselves evicted. Yeah. Um, so I know you have a, a hard stop coming up here. I, I wanted to fit in one last question um, from an old friend of mine here, Suzette Shaw. Uh, and she notes that you are fairly unique among national politicians in having uh, walked the streets of Skid Row with, with perhaps with her or, or her, her colleagues um, and people with lived experience in Skid Row. Um, and you had the opportunity to sit down with the women of that community. Um, she'd like to know what, what you learned from that experience and what would you say to currently unhoused people? One of the things I learned is that um, you can't tell uh, just by looking at people why they're there. Yeah. You can't stereotype people. I think the stereotype that a lot of people have is these are folks who are, addicts or 
uh, you know, have a, just a mental health issue or something else. I mean, I met people who were there for just a number of different reasons that they found themselves in that situation, including people who had been gainfully employed a few months before and never imagined that they would be in that situation. So I think the number one thing I learned, the thing I learned was that is that people find themselves homeless. Uh, they find themselves in this situation for many different reasons. That's and true. we can't have a cookie cutter approach to addressing homelessness and getting them out of that situation. You know, it has to, our policy has to be based on, on active listening and then creating from the ground up what's going to be most useful and helpful to the people that, that we're trying to empower. Um, the other thing that I learned there in LA that was drilled into my head when I was housing secretary and I also saw when I took a, a tour of the area is that it's not just Skid Row anymore. Yeah. That, I mean, and y'all see this all the time. I mean, folks are sleeping in, under underpasses and along sidewalks in parts of the greater LA area that just a few years ago, people never would have imagined, did not think of as places where you would see that. And you can write that story now in, in big community after big community and, and some suburbs of those communities. And so I just bring that back again to this notion that all of us have a responsibility, whether you're a member of Congress or a state legislator or the mayors of not only big but suburban cities, or the residents, frankly, who push their elected officials to do certain things, all of us have a responsibility to solve this challenge. It can't just fall on the same advocates and the same mayors and the same state legislators and the same people in Congress. Like we need to, we need to broaden our allies and, and people have a responsibility, I think, an obligation to get involved. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and I mean, I think, you know, what you said about, you know, people's behavior, even very liberal people's behavior at community meetings, neighborhood meetings, and some of the things, you, the rhetoric you hear around homelessness um, from people that you think should know better, <laughs> frankly, yeah, yeah. Um, really is can be shocking um, in a city like L.A., but I think that's probably the, the case that we lost, too. Um, so I know I know you gotta you gotta get on the on the TV and uh, you know probably tell us tell tell the world who the next president is going to be. Um, you know I I can't thank you enough for for taking the, the time during this busy election season um, to to join us and, and to talk through your your experience and share your knowledge about housing and how we can you know be a more uh, housing just society in in my view. Um, and so I, I really appreciate your time, uh, Secretary Castro, and I hope your, your family is doing well. I hope all your people in San Antonio and Texas and beyond are doing well. Um, and uh, it's been great to, to, to meet you in this way. Thanks a lot, Dr. Lentz. Thank you all for having me and uh, to everybody for tuning in. You know, I'm hopeful. Uh, I think that this election is going to turn out on the top of the ticket, which was, I think, the most important uh, race the way that many of us had hoped and that we're going to finally get to take a breath and then get to work on on moving our country forward and helping the most vulnerable people out there in a positive way again and i think it's a time for us to be courageous and to dream and then to reach for those dreams including on housing and so thank you to all the advocates and and scholars and everybody else who is going to have a role in doing that and uh We'll catch up with you soon. Fantastic. Appreciate that. Uh, next, I'm going to be joined by uh, Cecilia Estolano and Jose Loya. Um, I will introduce uh, Cecilia first. Um, and Cecilia, you can feel free to, to uh, show us your video and, and hang out with us um, visually. Uh, Cecilia Estolano, how do I, how do I introduce Cecilia? She plays, uh, many roles. Um, she is, uh, first and foremost, an expert in sustainable economic development, urban revitalization, 
Um, she has taught uh, in urban planning for us at UCLA as well at, as at Berkeley. Um, she is a, a, a proud alum of our urban planning program here at UCLA, um, where we bother her for a thousand different things in terms of uh, working with our students and as in her role uh, uh, as co-founder of ELP Advisors. Um, she happens to sit on uh, the University of California Board of Regents. Um, so she outranks me by like 25 different steps. Uh, and she is also on the uh, board of the Luskin School of Public Affairs. Um, she also has a graduate, a, a law, law degree from UC Berkeley. We love people from Berkeley too. Um, so please join me uh, in welcoming uh, Cecilia Estelano. Yay! Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, next, uh, I am also introducing uh, Jose Loya, who is an assistant professor in our uh, Department of Urban Planning at UCLA Luskin. He is also a faculty affiliate with the Chicano Studies Research Center. His research addresses Latino issues in urban areas by connecting um, ethno-racial inequality and contextual forces at the neighborhood, metropolitan, and national levels. Uh, lots of important work on housing and uh, racial stratification. Um, so I am very, very honored to be joined by uh, Cecilia and Jose. Okay, so that was a pretty robust conversation uh, with Secretary Castro. Um, you know, I think first I'd like to, uh, you know, get any first off reflections that um, each of you have. And, you know, I have a few questions and reflections of my own. And then, you know, we have a robust list of questions from our awesome audience that we could also dig into and just answer on the behalf of Secretary Castro, right? We can do whatever we want. So Cecilia, you want to kick this off a little, little bit? Happy to do so. Um, Michael, thanks for putting this together. I want to thank the Lewis Center. Um, that was a terrific interview and a conversation with Secretary Castro. Also looking at the chat box, uh, all the questions coming in, what a terrific group of participants. And I feel honored that we only dropped off by like 100 when he left. So, you know, and yet we still have 258. So these are folks who should be doing something else, but they want to be with us. Thank you for staying with us. Um, so let me just say a few things that I was struck with by the secretary's remarks. Um, first of all, this is about because we're in the situation we are. Let's assume that we do take the White House, that, that Democrats take the White House. We have a President Biden elect happening and we are not going to take over the Senate. Um, the secretary outlined very briefly, but I think really the strategy, right? You wanna go in, undo harm that's been done um, through guidance, executive yes. orders, all of the things that the administration actually has quite a bit of power to do. So first undo the harm. Second, he said, let's take a look at some of the Obama era regulations that were either put on hold or reversed and see what, what might, we move forward on that list. And then third, he talked about looking across the aisle, the reality of trying to make common cause with folks who can be our allies, maybe for specific populations, for specific issues. He gave the example of Susan Collins, caring a lot about youth homelessness. He talked about what the administration, the Obama administration had been able to do on veterans, which was really quite tremendous. So as much as we wanted to see the full $640 billion of the Biden housing plan move forward, like in the first 100 days, we need to be very strategic um, and we need to work fast. Because I will say this, I know that um, all throughout the last several months, there have been very, very bright people looking at what should happen in the first 100 days, what should happen in the first day of a Biden administration on a variety of different issues. Right. So I've got to imagine that not just Secretary Castro, but a number of other people have that short list of things that they provided to the policy team um, in the Biden camp. And I am hopeful that they will move swiftly. As he said, we need to be creative and assertive. Mm -hmm. And the assertive is critical. It's there's a lot of harm to undo, but there's a lot of good that needs to be done quickly. And so let me just talk about two other things. Um, first, 
working on the scale that the problem demands. That is going to be the most challenging because we're going to see all kinds of evictions, as he noted, happening all across the country. This is not just a blue city's problem. This is going to happen in rural America, suburban America, red and blue states at every income level. You're going to see evictions roll out over the next several months. So we need to immediately address that issue at a pretty phenomenal scale. So I am hopeful that the, um, we hope, Biden administration will be able to find common cause across the aisle on something that's fairly bold to address that immediate concern around evictions, which obviously is then also homelessness. Um, the second issue is the longer term issue of housing production. I was looking at all of the questions being put in the chat box. So many of them were about how do we do this? How do we do that? How do we scale? And that is something that even though we do not control the Senate, this is one of those moments where all across the country, we can make the case that rapidly scaling up housing production at a variety of income levels is not just good for people, not just good for those who could be housed, but good for the construction workers and good for the communities in which this housing can be built. And this may be one of those cases where, as much as I loathe using the tax code as a mechanism to do things, it should really just be about more efficient putting the money out and getting the stuff built. This may be one of those moments where we have to tweak the tax code again. Um, and and I, when I, I went on the Biden um, housing plan website and they had a big point around um, Section 542C, kind of the risk sharing program to build housing for seniors, where essentially the federal government takes on some risk and then local agencies, certified agencies can um, kind of put out a call and reduce the borrowing costs so that private developers can build senior housing, essentially. Maybe we need to do something like this at scale. I know I'd like to say it for affordable, but we already have a low-income housing tax credit. I might venture to say maybe what we really need to do is propose this for working people, for folks who are in that sweet spot of 80 to 120, maybe even 150, 175%. Because certainly, and, and Michael, you had asked us to kind of ground this federal discussion in in Southern California. So, so I say this as a Southern Californian who's been racking my brain on how do we address that missing middle? Well, maybe this is something where we can appeal across the aisle, come up with a good missing middle uh, financing strategy that's around tax incentives, tax credits, uh, uh, buying down uh, uh, financing costs, something very creative so that we can quickly put out a call for private developers to just start pumping out really quality housing for that missing middle for working people. And I'll stop there because I know Jose has got a lot more to say, but um, there, there's just, we don't have time. We need to immediately hit the ground running, get rid of what was bad, what was the harm that was done, just fix some stuff that's easy to do in the first hundred days, but then immediate look for those un, unexpected alliances to do something bold and big which the times demand. And I would say that has to do in evictions and it has to do in housing production. Yeah, uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful summary. And, you know, I think, you know, a, a specific call to action um, that yeah, I think uh, the secretary kind of kind of teed up there, but that brings a lot of specifics on, on how you might see that happen in the first hundred days and beyond. Um, Jose, do you have some, some reflections as well? Yeah, so thank you everyone for, for having me. Uh, and thank you to, for the, uh, to the Lewis Center for putting on this incredible talk. Um, I think going back, going to what Cecilia said, um, there's two things that really stood out to me during this conversation. Uh, the first was that reaching across the aisle, especially knowing the, the current political landscape and what that's potentially going to look like, hopefully in the next few days, we, we, we get more certain. Um, and the second was really understanding that we all have to do our part. It came up in several different issues. Um, the first related to um, public housing and how we have a stigma around public housing in the traditional sense. And we really haven't invested in that area, uh, especially in our communities, especially here in Los Angeles. Um, the second is also thinking about the differences and the responsibilities that we have in our spatial environment. So more specifically, Rather than thinking about um, just 
putting affordable housing, thinking about where it needs to be placed. So doing our parts in the suburbs, in urban areas, in rural areas, thinking about the different communities that really need it um, and the different marginalized communities that, aren't ne- that are often neglected in our political system. And I think he made a really good point when he brought up the different senators that are really attracted to both veterans and youth homelessness. These are, these are small pockets of, of, of our community, but need tremendous investment. Um, especially when we think about how our, soci- our, our how our society operates and the type of social mobility that that we want for all um, for all our society's members, and so those are the two biggest things that came up. And the third one, actually, um, which was, and and he didn't really he he touched on it was and and Cecilia brought it up the tax code, but more specifically how we think about home ownership in the U.S. also has to change and is also changing, right? So it wasn't just that. We're, we're stuck in this one way of thinking of home ownership as the end all be all, but thinking about new and, and creative ways to incentivize home ownership, but more for the, the benefits that it adds to our communities and not necessarily as a way to create and maintain inequality in our society. And so that's something that really stood out. I, I don't have the solutions for that. I don't think, you know, maybe I'll have to read Biden's in depth plan to see what that looks like. But those are things that. As a secretary of HUD, like that's really important when, when it's the you know when you're talking about HUD and they're talking about rethinking home ownership, that's something that 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 really uh, had me thinking. Yeah, I, I think you know both of you have, have very much helped me kind of um, better understand both you know Cast some of the points that Castro was making and um, you know some of the constraints going forward or or goals. Um, you know, I guess. You know, a couple things we've you've touched on this. Each of you touched on this al- already, but like, you know, I just don't know where I, I can I can see undoing harm as 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 like something that is implementable, right? I can see other ex- executive actions as being something that like you can do. Um, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about a, a caveat I have there, but like this idea of reaching across the aisle in 2020, in 2021, um, in 2022, like that, it, it doesn't worry me as like, you know, an ideal, it worries me in practicality, right? Like, um, if Mitch McConnell's, you know, only guiding principle in the first four years of the Obama administration was to make him a one-term president. Is that not going to be Mitch McConnell's guiding principle for Joe Biden is to make him a one-term president. And like, if that means like, you know, getting in the way of really controlling and fighting the virus in really like designing a recovery act that gets that protects people and has like housing production, housing construction, labor, like components to it, um, you know, in ways that would like really support the economy and a kind of 21st century housing plan. Um, I do certainly worry that at the end of the day, you're not going to find the people across the aisle anymore once that becomes like a clear way to support the president. Um, You know, and then the the other, you know, there were two, to me, like there were two words, you know, there was bipartisan, you know, and then there was incentivizing, right? Like, so in some of this rulemaking, it's about um, the federal government either handing some carrots or waving some sticks to local governments about housing production, housing opportunity, um, you know, fair housing efforts, et cetera. And, you know, that was, it's it's such a shame that the AFFH rule did not um, get time to kind of do something uh, in in the Obama administration, because by the time it was rescinded, we hadn't really learned about how the federal government is going to really calibrate that carrot and stick approach. Um, and so like that, you know, that's, that's fixed, that's doable, but like designing the right set of incentives is tricky. Yeah. 
I, I want to note something else. And I think, Jose, you picked up on a little bit when you talked about everybody having doing their fair share. Um, Secretary uh, Castro mentioned the Prosperity Playbook program they had where they picked five localities and the Bay Area was one of them. Of course, we weren't, but the Bay was. Anyway, no hard feelings there. But, um, but the, uh, the point was they were trying to integrate a variety of different planning perspectives, whether it was transportation, transit-oriented development, but trying to bring the suburbs to the table. And again, grounding this in Southern California, we're trying to do that right now. You've got poor SCAG <laughs> with its uh, you know, role over this over, over distributing RENA allocations and also trying to figure out a bundle of incentives, right, Michael? Um, whether it's REAP or LEAP to help local governments change their rules, uh, come up with different programs to meet their RENA goals, doing everything possible with relatively little money to make it easy. Um, this is one of those things where the federal government by dangling, you know, cobble together some funds from something that's already been funded and pull it together. And if you want to call it prosperity playbook or something else, um, but dangle a few funds and make it available to MPOs who are investing in these kinds of rezoning enterprises, uh, pool resources for cities to do the rezonings they need, to make it easier to do ADUs, to make it easier to do fourplexes, you know, smaller things that when multiplied all throughout the suburbs all throughout our 88 cities have impact. So it's not all being built in Los Angeles. Uh, that's the kind of leadership where from a federal standpoint, not a lot of money, but a little bit dangled to force that type of collaboration can make a difference. So I'll go back even further in the Obama administration to um, the Sustainable Communities Partnership, which was HUD. EPA and DOT, and later uh, US uh, Department of Energy became a part of this as well. But the idea was how do we encourage cities to think about the integration between transportation, housing, economic development, environmental protection. Uh, let's pull that together in these planning grants. And it really did integrate thinking in a way, accelerated that integrated thinking much faster than would have happened, but for the Obama having that initiative. Again, it was relatively small amount of money but that leadership on the issue, it set a North Star. And I think that with Republican control of the Senate, I know you're fearful of bipartisanship, Michael, but that's the only way we get anything big done. And, and I do feel like this is one of those administrations they've been around the block. Um, if it's a brick wall, they'll keep moving, right? It doesn't mean that because you're trying to move forward on, on a piece of legislation that talks about more housing production, creates new programs, doesn't mean you don't still keep dealing with the executive actions. You don't still keep trying to create these incentive programs where you're reconstituting money and creating these, these new pools that incentivize activity. So, so I did want to call that out because I think anytime you have one of those programs that gets communities to compete, to change the way they do business, you can have a really tremendous impact without a huge costly program. And that may be what we're faced with, sadly. Yeah. yeah and I think, I mean, going back to what you just discussed, I think uh, right after the crisis, um, the federal government, or right after the Great Recession, the federal government instituted the uh, Neighborhood Stabilization Program in various cities throughout the country to stabilize the mortgage market, or more specifically, the housing markets um, in a, across various cities. And that showed tremendous success. And a lot of it was funding money, funding nonprofit organizations to really start one, they knew the communities that they were in. Second, they were then able to hire the types of businesses that they wanted to redevelop vacant properties and really stabilize low income neighborhoods that were decimated during the recession. So cities like Detroit, uh, Miami, Phoenix, um, not so much Los Angeles because it still stayed pretty robust, um, but smaller areas like including Stockton in, in, in California, they showed tremendous promising growth because this small money was really funneled to the communities and it wasn't expensive at the federal level. Now at the local level it is, but at the federal level it was, it, it was not much. Um, and this helped dramatically shift what that, those, the real estate markets look like for those low income areas without necessarily displacing uh, families that, 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 that wanted to stay. Right. Hey, Michael, I'm going to ask Jose a question because I get to, because here I am. 
So right. you've done a lot of work on mortgages, on sort of the 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 issue of home ownership, right? And and I was looking at the chat box. All these questions came in around home ownership, the mortgage deduction. How do we look at um, home ownership as as a form of wealth generation for dispossessed communities, right? As opposed to just sort of protecting our own. And and I don't know, Jose. This would be a great time to talk about like what wh- how. If we got to do something fun on this, how would you ima- reimagine it? So it is a way, I'm not saying that it's reparations, but you actually have to have a very intentional approach to home ownership um, because so many of the programs in the past specifically were discriminatory, right? And that generational wealth has continued on, and yet Black and brown people have not benefited because of the way those programs were set into place in the first place. So I just wanted to serve that question up to you because this is your work, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, that's an excellent question. I think um, the, the mortgage deduction is a huge benefit and a huge carrot for lots of middle-class and upper-class families. It's not so much a carrot for low-income families that are trying to buy a home in low-income areas. Simply they're, the deductions, the standard deductions are probably higher if, if you yeah. have a family before than the mortgage deduction on a, on a $100,000 home or $200,000 home. Now, that may not be the case in Los Angeles because homes are uh, really expensive. Um, however, um, when we think about home ownership, I like to think of buying a house as like two forms. It's a consumption good and an investment. And we often view uh, when we make decisions... Um, about the investment side of the house. And that's where it can be really problematic for low-income families. And so the consumption side changes because families grow, they shrink, depending on the needs of the family, people want to move, uh, people like certain things inside their houses, uh, outside their houses. And a lot of that can be, is just dictated simply by demographic characteristics, right? Like where you are in your family, where you are in life, so to speak. However, on the investment side, we need to begin to, to think about challenging ourselves in what it means um, to create wealth, and especially because it's the largest vehicle for creating wealth in the US. And so this is where inequality really is concentrated. And so when I think the, 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 our, our, our secretary uh, Castro brought it up, which was we don't incentivize renters in any way. We don't incentivize any type of, we don't give credit to people that are paying their rent. Yet we give credit to people that are investing for their own wealth. And so we need to begin to think about, I know they made changes in the last, um, in the last tax reform that has brought down the amount that an individual can request in terms of mortgage interest deductions. But we also have to think about credits like first-time home ownership. So that might be specifically targeted to specific income brackets that we can help. Right. So if we're thinking about social mobility, we don't want to prevent access to home ownership. We want to provide access to low income families so that they can now have the ability to increase their wealth and their mobility. Now, the second factor, uh, which is not my area, which is actually what Michael studies, uh, is segregation. Right. A lot of these prices of homes is directly correlated to the segregation of our neighborhoods. So it's not necessarily just access to mortgage credit. It's also where these homes you're buy, where you're buying this home and the direction in which it's it's essentially appreciating in value right and so i think mike you can talk a little bit or a lot more about segregation stuff yeah well i mean i think that that you some summed it up pretty well right and i think where i would pick up with that is you know specifically what what you mean is like um housing investments mean very different things um you know even you know, two people buy or two families buy uh, uh, two different houses for two hundred thousand dollars in two different neighborhoods, and the white family buys in a, a white neighborhood th- where the trajectory is like this, and a black family buys the same value house in a black neighborhood where the trajectory is more like this, or you know, it's there's still a long hangover from the Great Recession. Like, you know, there's lots of evidence that, um, y- you know, people. Uh, that you know, we basically discount um, housing that is in uh, diverse neighborhoods even now, um, and so like that that housing via as this you know um, undefeated kind of 
investment vehicle is just not been the experience for uh, uh, homeowners of color, even when they do enter the housing market. Um, so I wanted to, to grab a couple of the uh, questions that are, are still remaining in the, in the chat that were actually pointed towards us. So uh, Cecilia um, basically asked um, a version of, of Florentina's question about uh, gener generational wealth. Um, and then there's a question from David Wiseglass ab um, about you know, stating that you know, California's most aggressive housing legislation has failed several years in a row, often due to the idea that private market, market construction only caters to rich people, um, acknowledging that public and subsidized housing should play a bigger role. How do we make sure the private market is also helping alleviate the crisis? Um, and, you know, I can jump yeah. in. Yeah. Um, so I want to jump in on that first one about the generational wealth of just a little bit of a side. I know this is a housing panel, but I want to set aside something else. Um, we'd be, so our, uh, our, our firm did a project with LISC in Los Angeles with Tanua Thrash and LISC, uh, uh, basically an action plan on how to do economic development in three specific areas in South LA. But will it be focus of that was really around um, minority-owned businesses. And what we found, which everybody knows, is like, because all this happened right in the middle of COVID, we had to pivot a little bit. But but what we know is most of those businesses, they don't own the space that they rent and they're particularly vulnerable. So we think, I know this is a housing panel, so I'm just going to say I'm going a little bit down a rabbit hole, but why do we have a housing crisis? There are kind of two reasons, right? One is we're not building enough. And second, people don't make enough money, Right. And people don't make enough money for lots of historic reasons on not protecting workers and allowing untrammeled capitalism, blah, blah, blah. But the point is we need to actually help on the income side because the housing and affordability is really more a symptom of income inequality and what we've been doing wrong in our society. So if you want to deal with the housing crisis, you can't actually build your way out of it. You have to actually address the wealth side too, the income and wealth side. And so one argument is, I saw Don Spivak in one of his uh, one of his comments said, "Hey, you can think about housing as part of infrastructure." I agree with you, Don. But but the other thing you can think about is on the one way of dealing with housing is to help businesses, which are you know Los Angeles produces more minority business. Minority businesses actually get produced at higher rate than any place else, right? That's most of the businesses that are being created are are owned by people of color here. Um, help them get some form of equity, and maybe we need to explore things like. Um, limited equity uh, ownership structures of retail centers and industrial centers. So I just want to put a pin in that because when I was at the redevelopment agency, we didn't look at these as two sides of, the, of a shop. There was housing and there was economic thought. We viewed it integrated, right? You have to have, um, you have to basically recreate, rebuild the middle class. And you don't do that by just building affordable housing. You actually do that by, by building middle class jobs and careers. So I have to always say that even when I'm on a housing panel. Um, the second thing I would say is, you know, if I had my druthers, yeah, we would do a gigantic spend of federal dollars right now. And it would more than pay for itself by putting money out to the private sector to just go build it. We'd say we want this many units of this type of income scale to this type of quality in these markets go. And then we would set some sort of incentive program for cities to make it happen so that cities that did not change their zoning or, or somehow stop the production of this housing would see would see consequences on the federal transportation side, for example, or other types of funding side. You've got to use both the carrot and the stick. Housing is not just about the carrot. I'd like to say it was, but for all of the reasons that the secretary noted, and we talked about you'll get shouted down if you tell the suburbs that poor people are going to come live with them. So you need some big old stick. And that big old stick, it's very difficult to do that locally, a little easier for the for the state to do it, which is why you've seen this attempts to do it at the state level, but always beaten back by the local governments, which we understand. At some level, the federal government has to come in and say it's a national crisis. So yes, if I had my druthers, federal money would be flowing out to the private sector to come up with good cost-effective construction. Because I'll tell you one more thing, and everybody on the, on the low-income housing side can hate me for this, LIHTC such an inefficient program. Oh my gosh, so clearly not designed by people who actually cared most about housing first, right? 
It is a holdover from a tax code rewrite. So the fact that that is the chief engine for production of low-income housing in this country is really sad, right? The layers, the transaction costs, the legal counsel, the financing, the layers of financing, it's ridiculous, but it's all we have. We need to actually start building huge chunks of housing through big, big programs. Okay, not going to happen probably because of the Senate. So in lieu of that, we're going to have to figure out some other way through tax incentives, tax programs, you name it, to produce different types of housing. And I happen to think that one way to do it is try to look at that missing middle. You may have more success if you're building for the working class, the middle class, than if you say you're coming in for very, very low income housing, housing for the homeless. You know, that's really hard to sell. I just want to see more production other than luxury. Okay, I'm happy. Jose, take it off. Go well, for it. You, you answered a couple couple good questions there. That was very efficient, actually. Uh, Jose, did you want to follow up there? No, no. I, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll. So, um, you know, one thing to follow up there is is the next. There's another question uh, from from Kevin about um, you know some programs being very durable, like Litech. Um, where others are, have, have not been as durable. Um, so what kind of explains that? And, and you know, so that's an interesting follow-up in a way to uh, Cecilia's Litech bashing, which I largely concur with. Um, <laughs> I know, I know, it's hard. So, I mean, and, and Litech is, is part of the, the tax code, right? It's it's almost this this incidental program that, is, that has become so big, but like, I don't know if I have a great story as to why it's so durable, aside from the because fact... Because it's a corporate tax break for corporations. We love tax breaks. It's yes. a super cheap tax credit for them. An entire industry has grown up out of it. And once you create a tax benefit, it's very hard to take it away. Yeah. And any efforts to take it away would have to be accompanied, unless you're a Republican administration, with a new effort to, to substitute it. Something to substitute it um, would really just call to call to the question of saying, yeah, okay, instead of this convoluted tax credit program where we pretend we're not spending money, but we really are, mm. instead of that, we're actually going to put money into housing for poor people. Guess what? People will freak out. So, um, so I, I, I had hoped that if we had controlled the Senate, that there would be an ability to package a whole big housing, new housing program that wasn't just LITEC, notwithstanding the fact that Biden's housing plan is just about expanding LITEC. So, sorry, I'm talking too much. Sorry, Michael. Okay. Jose, yeah. you got to have a comment to that. <laughs> well, I think when when I think of low income or, or just wealth, I, I, you brought up a couple of points. And for me, I think one of the things that we have to reevaluate, um, and this does go back to the tax code, is is just how 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 we allow individuals to sell their homes essentially tax free because we have this idea that they paid for their property taxes and 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 and, and because they pay pay for their property property taxes yearly we have well when they sell it then they don't they've already been taxed every year and, and so forth yet we don't when, when we when we consider that we we essentially give a tax break to wealth to this huge wealth and I think we're creating an additional incentive for for home ownership. And I think we have to like reevaluate what we're trying to do because clearly, we're n even if we brought in all the federal funds that we wanted, we, we can't build. I, I would argue that we have such a short supply of housing and affordable housing that we would have to be building for years and years and years before we even came, before we even got to an optimal level or even close to an optimal level. I know, like I've read articles on the New York Times saying, like, not in or you know groups groups forming like in my neighborhood as like this, not in my neighborhood, but the counter. And nice. right, and, and I always and I kind of I'm like it doesn't really matter because they're not building enough that it's going to matter to your property. Like, it's going to have an impact on property ta on on your property values. And I think a lot of this, well, ha I think most of the fear is, is due to racism and classism. Uh, but I think the other half is, or the other part is, people are afraid that their property will go down and that they're going to lose a lot of the wealth. But I think we have to reevaluate how we tax this because when people sell or or transfer it over to their kids, um, they they really are able to to continue to just take it, 
And, and over across generations, we see that this has dramatic impacts on low income areas where they become starved from resources because we're not taking the resources from other neighborhoods to, 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 to bring up the properties or to bring up the quality of life in the city like, like Los Angeles. And so it's not just about creating low income housing as much as it's also creating like a disincentive for property values to continue to operate the way they are. And so that we can create a, a more stable uh, real estate market when it comes to property values. Um, yeah. All right. I mean, you know, as a, as a country in a society, we've never really decided, like, do we want housing to be more expensive or less, you know, and, and um, do we want this un, unstoppable like engine of growth or do, do we want like values to, to, you know, be, to, to rise in a, in a, in a fashion that is, also going to allow for complementary affordability. Um, so, you know, I want to wrap this up here. Um, it's, you know, everybody's got a lot going on on Thursday, November 5th. And, um, you know, I'm in awe of our audience that continues to hang with us um, through, through a very distracted day and week. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, if I had to summarize some of our, our takeaways, of course, we are living, we, we are under a, a, certainly a moment of great uncertainty politically and, and how that affects housing going forward. Um, and, you know, and, and maybe, maybe the most 2020 thing possible, of course, like, it might be that the best we can do is to undo harms, right? <laughs> you know, like we we might uh, we might dri we might run into to uh, twenty twenty one with you know looking. Oh, at we got to do better than undoing harm. Okay. I'll take your optimism, Cecilia. I will yeah. I will ride that optimism. And and but the next thing I was going to say is 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 really taking your, your 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 emphasis seriously on being creative and working fast. Right. And, you know, I don't, it's hard, you know, for me, it's just hard, very hard to, to forecast kind of where we're going to be in January um, and February and March with this incredible crisis already in front of us um, in, in COVID and how that's going to, you know, affect uh, other dominoes of, of federal policy um, going forward. But, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, four years goes by really fast. This last four years, of course, was 75 years, but the, the four years going forward is, is, is likely to be rather speedy. Um, and, you know, there's going to be a lot of priorities and housing's got to be right there at the top. Um, and if it's not, then we're going to continue to struggle across the country with affordability problems. Uh Great summation, Michael. I guess the, the one thing I would say is speed, 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 right? I think it's super important. Um, the reason I think we're going to be front and center, housing's going to be front and center, is because of COVID and because of eviction. Sadly, that's why. Mm. And every crisis creates an opportunity. Um, we are so blessed to have such seasoned policymakers like Secretary Castro around. You got to know, he's. I, I have to imagine, he's a big advisor to, to the vice president. Um, and I just... I got to imagine there's a laundry list of things they're going to do right out of the gate, but we got to support them. And we also have to hold them accountable that right. more than just in doing harm, if we're worried about people getting evicted, what's there's one thing to keep them in their homes, but can we come up with something creative so that both the landlord and the tenant are getting a little bit more protection? It's that taking it from just crisis response to remaking the world a little bit more in the image of what we would like. And that's, I think, the magic uh, of good governance. And right. we've seen four years of true incompetence. So I think we're going to be so happy to have competence. Yeah. And let's hope there'll be more than competence. And this is where you guys who are academics, you've been toiling away for four years. If you have a brilliant idea, this is the time, right? This is the time to write, talk, pro proselytize, um, because there's an opening whenever there's a crisis this big. Of course. Yeah, I agree. 
Well, thank you so much, uh, Cecilia and, and Jose um, for, for joining us. I mean, this has been such a, a robust discussion, um, you know, kind of a funky format where like we're, we're talking about the guests after, after they left. I think, I think <laughs> if, he, if he watches the video that uh, he will, he will not find that we talked bad about him after he left, which is, you know, that's how we do it at UCLA. You know, we're not, not going to talk bad about you behind your back. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, um, uh, Cecilia and Jose. And of course, thank you to the audience for, for uh, dialing in. Um, and I hope everybody's uh, doing well and, and uh, trying to relax any way they can. Um, and we will uh, see you on a screen somewhere soon. Awesome. Bye. Bye. Stay safe. Stay safe. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.